Good morning. And welcome to part two of Van Dievener Black's webinar, Legal Ways to Help You Grow. Thank you for joining us today. Next slide, please. Today, your presenters will be Ann Bebo and myself, Jonathan Gallo. Ann is a partner at Van Dievener Black, and she, along with myself, co-chairs the Hemp and Cannabis Practice Group. Anne is also the head of the Labor and Employment Group, and she is also in our litigation practice group. I am co-head of the Cannabis and Hemp Practice Group, um, and I'm also um, co-head of the uh, technology group at Van Dievener Black. Um, I got my start in cannabis as a regulator back in 2013 when I was part of the team at the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services that developed and implemented the therapeutic cannabis program for the state of New Hampshire, which is still in operation uh, today. Next slide, please. So today we're going to drill down a little bit more on to some basics about uh, hemp and cannabis businesses. We're going to talk about basic business organizations. We're going to talk about contracts, and then we're going to move into banking issues, SBA loan issues, and wrap it up with a discussion about some employment issues regarding hemp and cannabis. Um, as in our last seminar, if you have any questions, we uh, would like for you to send them in the uh, question, the Q&A area of Teams. That's at the little bar when you hover your mouse over the screen. Um, it's got the question marks with the balloons. If you want to put your questions there, please do so. We plan on leaving a little bit of time at the end of the presentation to answer your questions. And if we don't get to your question, uh, certainly provide us with your contact information and we will be happy to follow up with you um, later on. And with that, I will turn over the slides to Ann Bebo. Hi everybody, good morning. Um, I'm going to start with some basics about business entities. A lot of people are jumping into the hemp industry right now and many um, and for many, the first step should be to establish a business. Um, sometimes people try to get into this as a sole proprietorship, and that's generally not recommended. So I'm going to review the four main types of business entities in Virginia and their pros and cons. There are some other entity forms in Virginia, but those are um, probably not going to be applicable for most businesses in the hemp industry. And the four I'm going to go over now are the most commonly used by for profit businesses. So the first one, is the sole proprietorship and this is the simplest form of business ownership i'm not going into more detail about each of these four in coming slides but first i'm just going to list them out for you so the first is sole proprietorship um, the second would be partnership and that's when two or more people are running a business for profit next slide please the next um, form is the corporation, which I'm sure many of you are somewhat familiar with. It's when an entity is owned by shareholders, it's run by officers, and it's supervised by a board of directors. And then the fourth um, business entity that I'll talk about is the limited liability company or, or LLC. It's a hybrid business entity. It operates under an operating agreement um, and it, it well, we say it's a hybrid because it has the tax characteristics of a partnership, but it has the limited liability characteristics of a corporation. So for that reason, a lot of businesses find it to be very advantageous. Next slide, please. So with each of the business entities I'm going to go over, when you're trying to think about which would be right for your business, um, there are four questions to look at with regard to each structure. The first is, you know, what is it? And then who owns it? Who controls it? And what are the liabilities involved? And you know, the flip side of that, what are the benefits involved? Next slide, please. So sole proprietorship, as I mentioned, this is um, the default. It's when you start doing business on your own and you don't set up a business entity, you're really operating as a sole proprietorship. It's um, one person owning his or her own business without forming a business entity. Um, the only thing that's really required is that you would register your trade name and secure a business license. And once you have that, you're off to the races and you can do work. But there are a lot of risks involved if you don't have an actual formation. And that's why sole proprietorship is often not a good choice. Um, the sole proprietorship would be owned by the individual. 
Um, it's the simplest form of business ownership. Next slide, please. The sole proprietor controls the business, um, and because there's no separate business entity, the sole proprietor really is the business. And so he or she can co-mingle personal funds and business property and funds. So this this works out great if you're running a if you're a kid running a lemonade stand, you are a sole proprietorship. That's kind of what it is. And just as a kid running a lemonade stand has no protection from any type of liability, neither does an adult running a, a business as a sole proprietor. Um, there's unlimited personal liability. If you make a mistake um, or if someone says you made a mistake, then you personally would be liable. They could come after not only your business assets, but your personal assets because there's no distinction when you have a sole proprietorship. It's all one and the same. So your house is up for grabs. Um, and any income that you earn as a sole proprietor would be taxed just like your other income. It would just go on your um, normal tax return as an individual and it's only taxed at one time. Next slide, please. So a partnership is um, offers some more protection for a business owner and a partnership is an association of two or more people that are operating a business for profit and they're co-owners and there are three main types of partnerships. Again, there's some um, some other forms, but there are three main types. The first would be a general partnership, and that's when all the parties are equally involved and um, they're all subject to personal liability. A limited partnership is kind of a mixture of general and limited, has a mixture of both general partners and limited partners. And then there's a limited liability partnership, and that's where all the partners have limited liability. The partnership is owned by the partners, and each partner will contribute um, capital to the business, either money, property, or services, and then the partners share in the profits and losses. Next slide, please. The partnership is controlled by the partners. They have equal rights in management unless they have a partnership agreement that says otherwise. And the agreement, of course, for a partnership is going to be very key. There are a lot of um, terms that will be laid out in the partnership agreement that will control each partner's rights with regard to management and with regard to distributions. General partners typically have more control in a limited partnership and that's because they have a lot more skin in the game. They actually have more liability because general partners are liable for all the debts and obligations. Limited partners are liable only to the extent of their capital contributions. That's why they're called limited partners. They have limited liability. And then with a partnership, all the profits and losses are passed through to the partners. Um, in tax parlance, this is referred to as a pass through entity because the partnership itself isn't taxed. The profits and losses are passed on to the partners and then reported on the partner's um, tax return. So it's only taxed once at the individual level. Next slide, please. Corporations. Um, this is a business entity that's formed by filing articles of incorporation and that you would file it with the State Corporation Commission in whichever state you choose to incorporate. Upon incorporation, a Virginia corporation is a legal entity. It has um, an identity that's separate from its owners, and that offers a lot of protection, as I'll go into on the next slide. Um, the shareholders own the company, and they own it in a proportion equal to their percentage of shares. Next slide, please. So who controls a corporation? The shareholders elect the directors, and there are some matters that shareholders shareholders will vote on as well, um, and that's going to be determined in the Articles of Incorporation. The directors um, who are elected by the shareholders, they represent the shareholders and they appoint the officers, and the officers are the ones who control the day-to-day -day operations of the business. Next slide, please. One of the great advantages of a corporate structure, a corporation, is that the shareholders are typically not liable for any corporate debts. Um, they can receive the distributions, but they're not going to be liable for corporate um, debts. So that's that's a big advantage. For taxation purposes, there are two options. A corporation can be a C corporation, and that's the most common type. When you have a C corp, the corporation pays corporate tax on the profits of the corporate of the corporation's business. The corporation files its own tax returns, pays taxes on the income, and then when it issues distributions to its shareholders, the shareholders will report those distributions, also known as dividends, 
on the shareholders tax returns. So in that sense, the profits are actually taxed twice. And that is a, a drawback there. S corporations are um, similar to corporations in all respects, except that with um, when it comes to the income taxes, the income losses and deductions and credits are passed through to the shareholders. So an S corp is a pass through entity. And as a result, the corporation itself doesn't pay income tax. The only the shareholders pay taxes on the income. Next slide, please. And then the last business entity I'm going to talk about is the limited liability company. And these are very popular um, primarily because they're pretty easy to set up. Um, they're great for small businesses. There are large businesses that use LLC formation as well, but they're particularly good for smaller businesses um, because of the ease with which you can set one up. It's an entity with one or more members and the owners of a LLC are referred to as members. They're not shareholders, they're members. Um, but the LLC will, you can have a, a one person, a single member LLC, or you can have as many members as you'd like. But the members um, form the LLC by filing articles of organization um, and it combines the tax characteristics of a partnership with the limited liability characteristics of a corporation. It's owned by the members. The membership's share, each member's ownership share is set forth in the operating agreement. And the operating agreement is the key document with a limited liability company. It governs the member's rights in the um, company, uh, what their ownership share is, who controls, all that is set forth in the um, operating agreement. Nonetheless, despite the importance of an operating agreement, I occasionally run across an LLC that never got around to writing one, which is definitely not advised. If you have an LLC, you definitely want to have an operating agreement. It's a very important document. Um, next slide, please. The LLC is um, controlled, as I mentioned, by however it's set out in the operating agreement. The those documents will specify whether it's going to be a member managed LLC or manager managed LLC. The member managed LLC is the simplest structure and under that type of LLC, every member would have authority to act on behalf of the business. Um, some LLCs instead go with a manager managed LLC, which means that in the operating agreement, you set forth a separation between the ownership and the management. So the members won't have any authority to act or conduct business on behalf of the business simply because they're members only the members who are elected to be managers have that type of authority and that allows more control. The next slide, please. So with regard to liabilities, members and managers are not personally liable for any obligations to the LLC simply because their members are managers. So it does offer um, protection for the for the members that they have liability protection. They may be responsible to the LLC for their own acts or omissions or for any obligations that are undertaken by agreement. They're not responsible for the acts, omissions, or obligations of the other members or the managers, however. And this is another pass through entity, meaning that the income is not taxed at the LLC, it's um, passed on to the members and taxed once at the membership level. Next slide, please. So, you know, is, is you're thinking about which business entity would be best for your business. One thing to keep in mind is even when you do have liability protection in your business structure, such as with you go with an LLC or a corporation, which would limit personal liability, even with that in place, there are circumstances in which the um, personal in which liability can be imposed on the individual notwithstanding the corporate structure or the LLC structure, there can be personal liability in certain circumstances. And that's often referred to as piercing the corporate veil. Um, and there, there are ways that this happens. And this is kind of a, a way or something very important for business owners to be aware of, because if you commit any of these acts, you could open yourself up for personal liability, even though you have a nice corporate structure, you have an LLC and you filed all the paperwork, you could still be personally liable. And probably the biggest error we see is when the business formalities aren't observed. Yes, you set up an LLC, but you still operate the business like it's your um, own personal piggy bank. You commingle funds so that your personal funds are commingled with company funds. You want to get um, 
new car, so you draw money on the company um, account, you take a vacation, you draw money on the company account, and you're not maintaining those corporate formalities, those business formalities, that these are separate entities. The business and you are separate entities. And when you do that, you're going to run the risk that a litigant who wants to come after you will be able to take assets of the business and take your personal assets and say, under the theory that there really isn't any difference, um, that basically the business has been used as your alter ego. And you'll see that down as the fourth bullet point there. Um, another way is if you're acting ultra viris, which means that you're acting outside your role as um, a member or as a director of the company, you're kind of um, off the reservation and doing your own um, thing without any authorization of the corporation or the LLC. And when you're acting without authorization, then there's a risk of personal liability. Um, one real big danger that I've seen time and time again, and it's kind of a hidden trap for a lot of business owners that they're just not aware of the risks involved, and that's a failure to pay over trust fund taxes. Trust fund taxes are any taxes that the business collects and turns over to the government. And the biggest example or the most common example would be um, payroll taxes. So if you have employees, you are responsible for withholding taxes from their paychecks and paying that money over to the government. Unfortunately for some um, businesses, particularly small businesses or businesses that are going through a rough patch financially, those trust fund taxes sitting in your bank account before you get around to sending them to the IRS are a huge temptation. When cash flow is, is tight, some businesses will tap into that money and they'll tell themselves, we'll, we'll make it up next month, we'll, we'll catch up next quarter, and they don't, and they fall behind. And when you fail to pay over your trust fund taxes, the government can come after you for the entire amount. It's um, called a 100% penalty, trust fund recovery penalty, and they come after you personally. And not just the business owner, they come after anyone who's deemed to be a responsible person. So that can be a business owner, it can be a officer of the company that has some authority over paying taxes, it can even be a manager if the manager had some authority over paying taxes. So that's a big trap for the unwary. Um, another way you can uh, have personal liability is if the business um, director or officer or manager breaches his or her fiduciary duties to the company. That can result in um, personal liability. There's some other statutory um, means of opposing personal liability. So there's just a lot of risk, even if you do have a really strong um, structure to your business, you still have to be careful and you shouldn't believe that you're, um, you're bulletproof, essentially. Next slide, please. Some other preliminary matters when you first start your business, you need to get an EIN, that's an employer identification number or taxpayer identification number. You get that from the IRS and that also helps to establish that the, the business is separate from you personally. Um, you need to get a business license. You get that from whichever city or county you're operating in. Um, as a hemp grower, processor, or dealer, you also have to register with VDAX, the Virginia Department of Agricultural agriculture and consumer services. There's a registration process. You need to go through that to get um, registered in order to do business as an industrial hemp grower, processor, or dealer. You need to register your business with the Virginia State Corporation Commission. That's required in order to do business in Virginia. And it's also how you're going to set up um, your corporation or LLC is through the Virginia State Corporation Commission. You need insurance. And there are a number of different insurance products out there. Um, and that's why it's important to have a good insurance broker that you can trust who's going to help guide your business to make sure you have the right coverage for exactly what you're doing so that all your risks are covered. And so that's, that's my sixth point there. Um, one of the preliminary matters you need to take care of is assembling a team of professionals because running a business does require a lot of professional advice um, there's that old saying from Poor Richard's Almanac about being penny wise and pound foolish. And sometimes businesses, particularly in the early stages, will try to save money by skimping on some of these things. And it always ends up costing a great deal further down the road. Um, you do need to have an attorney that you trust who can guide you on all these requirements on setting up your business and on everything else that you're going to be encountering as a business. You need to have a good accountant. Um, you need to have a bookkeeper. You need to have, as I mentioned, an insurance broker, 
and then there are there might be other vendors that you need to have depending on um, how complex your business is and what you're getting into but you might need to have for example an IT consultant um, all these things are important but you need to address them early on so that you can get your business started on a firm foundation next slide please Okay, now we're going to start talking about contracts. I'm going to kick it off with some real basic stuff and then I'm going to pass the baton back to Jonathan to give you some more information about um, hemp specific contracts. But just some contract basics because even when you're in the hemp industry, you're not just going to have hemp specific contracts, you will have contracts for everything else in your business. Any um, contract that you are presented with, you need to be very careful. There's um, a, a common misunderstanding that oral contracts aren't enforceable and the truth is some oral contracts are enforceable but they're the problem with oral contracts and I, i'm using um oral to mean something that's spoken um you know a, a handshake uh, type of deal they they may be enforceable in some circumstances but the real problem is how are you going to prove it how are you going to prove what the terms of the deal were so if you have any intention of being bound um, by this agreement or any intention that the other person in the transaction will be bound, you really do want to have it in writing and signed. Some contracts by law have to be in writing or else they're, they're unenforceable. And that would be any contract dealing with real estate sales, real estate leases lasting more than a year, any agreement that can't be performed within a year, an agreement to answer for the debt of another or a contract for sale of goods worth $500 or more. So all those have to be in writing but even if a contract doesn't have to be in writing, it really, really should be in writing. Um, it's always important to have legal counsel review any agreement before you sign. Um, once you sign, it's pretty difficult to fix things, but if you have um, competent legal counsel review the contract to begin with, you can save yourself a lot of headache. As I mentioned, that's one of those um, cases of being penny wise and pound foolish when you skip on legal counsel before signing a contract. Also, don't reuse old agreements. We see this all the time where um, a client has uh, decided to cobble together an agreement for a new transaction using old agreements, and they often contain um, a lot of mistakes. Um, they will sometimes include provisions that just don't have any application to the situation, or they have inconsistent provisions because they, the parties have cobbled together. Um, I like this clause from this contract. I like this clause from that contract and they throw them all together without looking at them the way a lawyer or a court would look at them and realizing that they don't work together. So um, that's just another word of advice on that. And with that, we're going to go to the next slide and I'm going to pass it back to Jonathan. Thank you, Anne. Um, I just want to follow up on what Anne said about the reuse of other contracts. Uh, that applies not just in the cannabis and hemp industry, but in any industry. I mean, um, we've seen situations, uh, for example, I've seen situations in technology contracts where I'll be reviewing a contract or a set of terms and conditions, and I'll, I'll say to a client, oh, I didn't really uh, realize that you were in that line of business. And the, uh, the person said to me, well, we're really not. I said, well, you say it in here that you are and they say well we we kind of cobbled that together from from another contract that we used so you really need to be very careful reusing agreements particularly with regard to this particular field is uh it's not good it's not a one size fits all you shouldn't use a cookie cutter and i'm going to talk about some of the terms in general for contracts but i also want to relate them specifically to cannabis and hemp contracts so one of the key things also is to not only have a good contract, but also be prepared to enforce it. Uh, it's important to have a contract, but it's also important to be prepared to, if you're going to have a contract, that you're going to spend the effort to enforce it. Because if you're not going to enforce the contract, um, then it's then it's really not not worth the paper it's printed on. Enforcing contracts can cost a lot of money, but you can certainly write them to uh, minimize the risk uh, and potentially uh, lower the cost for enforcing the contract. And we're going to we're going to talk about some of those today. So. The first thing, as with any contract, uh, in particular these cannabis hemp contracts, is to have the parties correctly identified. So if you're if you're dealing with a particular grower or a particular processor, you want to make sure the parties are correctly identified. Are you dealing with the individual? Are you dealing with the LLC? Are you dealing with both? You know, some of these contracts you have individuals signed, but you want to make sure 
that it is a party that has the authority to bind the business entity. One of the business entities Anne was discussing, either the LLC or the corporation or the partnership. You want to make sure that there is somebody who has the authority to bind the business entity and they're correctly identified in the contract. You may also decide in a particular contract that you want a personal guarantee, but again, that's specific to your particular situation, which is another reason why you should not use a one size fit all or cookie cutter contract for any of the contracts in this particular line of business. The effective date. Now, uh, these types of contracts can have all manner of effective dates. They can be for a term of years. They can be for a term of you know, the growing season, depending on how long the growing season is, it can be from year to year. It can have an automatic renewal. It can have a renewal only upon agreement of the parties. You really need to think about uh, the effective date and how long you want the term to be when it starts and when it ends and when the parties are bound. And you also want to think about in your contract, which terms of the contract survive termination of the contract. Termination provisions are extremely important. What happens when the contract is terminated? Who can terminate it? Under what circumstances can it be terminated? So these are all things that need to be thought about, thought through down the road. We as lawyers, we always see everything bad. We always look for what ifs. We always look for what if everything falls apart? How is the client protected? And that's really what you have to think about when you are uh, looking, drafting, and signing these contracts. What are you getting yourself into? There are so many times I've seen so many cases, not just in cannabis and hemp contracts, but other sorts of contracts where people just sign them and, and you go back to the client and say, did you realize that it has this provision in it and you agreed to this? And difficult for us afterward, after the fact, to try and fix it uh, after it's already been signed. And then the terms of the deal, which I'm going to talk about in more detail uh, moving forward in the slides, but the terms are very important. Um, what the expectations of the parties are is extremely important. Choice of law is another important provision. Where, if there is a dispute, are you going to, number one, settle the dispute, and two, which law applies? You may be doing business with entities outside the Commonwealth of Virginia and other states. Um, you need to determine what the choice of law is going to be and what the venue is going to be. Um, you can certainly craft these provisions to try to protect yourself and save you costs, um, but uh, these are extremely important. Many times we see in contracts that the parties that signed them didn't really even consider the choice of law, and you find that you have somebody say signing a contract here in Virginia, but they agreed to uh, choice of law and venue in California. And say, well, you know, you realize now you can have to argue this potentially in California, and that's going to cost you a lot more money. So um, these, that's another thing you need to look at. And signatures. Talked a little bit about this before. What constitutes an appropriate signature? Can the contract be executed in multiple parts? Those are very important things to consider. Like I indicated earlier, do you want a personal guarantee in the contract or not? And you want to make sure that the person signing has the authority to bind the entity. Uh, that you're doing business with. And risk. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this moving forward. Indemnification provisions, particularly for ha cannabis hemp contracts. What if something goes wrong? Um, are you going to craft the contract so that you're protected? If there's a third party suit, if somebody gets hurt uh, or if somebody, uh, somebody has an accident, uh, is the other party going to indemnify you for the costs of defending that suit? That's something you need to think about. And Ann mentioned earlier insurance. We all understand uh, general uh, commercial liability insurance, but that may not cover everything when it comes to a cannabis hemp contract. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about crop insurance and in one of the next slides. So these are some general provisions, basic provisions in any contract uh, that need to be looked at, and they're equally applicable to cannabis hemp contracts. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little bit about hemp futures. And I'm going to really focus on uh, hemp, industrial hemp in, in this particular uh, in this particular presentation. So hemp futures are a contract between a buyer and seller before the hemp fully cultivates. Uh, the good thing about this is they lock in the price uh, for the most part. Um, and the contract can be based uh, on a season, on year to year. Uh, it can be a single purchase. 
It can be uh, an annual quota, and it can be for a specific number of acres or specific fields. Uh, any grower who's going to register in the Commonwealth of Virginia has to put down the address and the geographic coordinates of where the uh, hemp is going to be grown. Uh, and in your contract, you may want to specify specifically where that location is. Um, so hemp future contracts, uh, my apologies, it looks like we lost the slides, but I'm going to keep going. Um, so hemp futures contracts can be uh, hemp biomass futures contracts where the farmer is only required to give the buyer a certain amount of unrefined hemp biomass. Uh, usually uh, manufacturers uh, use this raw hemp to produce high CBD hemp oil and refine it into a distillate and isolate and other products. Um, we have hemp flower future contracts for farmers who are involved in supplying the buyer with hemp flowers, which are typically harvested uh, earlier in the growing process. That's best generally for farmers who are selling to distributors who are interested in making medicinal CBD products. And then you also have industrial hemp futures contracts. Um, they are they are good for buyers who are interested in making high CBD, high uh, high quality CBD products for medical use, um, and these contractors are concerned with transferring refined product uh, at the end of the harvesting season. So it's any one of a number of these particular types of contracts. And as I said before, you should not use a cookie cutter contract because each relationship is different. What is the contract's purpose? What are you going to be producing? Or on the other side, what are you going to be buying? What's going to be used? Um, you really need to look at what the relationship of the parties are and what the expectations are. Uh, next slide, please. So pricing can be based on a number of things. And again, each contract is different. Um, there's the cash payment, which is basically based on either the biomass or the floral weight. You can have contracts that are a combination of weight and percentage of CBD produced. You can have uh, contracts that are based on the acreage of production. You can have uh, combinations. You can have partial payments up front and partial payments for the processed product. You can have payment only for finished product. You can have payment for after processing or retail sales. They come in all forms. Um, some are just based on biomass weight that's that's brought to the processor. Uh, some are based on any one of a combination and some contracts have um, uh, the payment based on uh, the uh, refined product and uh, a percentage of the refined product that's produced from the raw biomass. So these are all important considerations for the contract. The key is to make sure the expectations are clear between the parties. What is the payment going to be? What is the payment going to be based on? Um, and uh, that it is clearly written in the contract. Next slide, please. Now in some of these contracts, Payments can be reduced or penalties applied if they fail to meet the buyer's specifications. They can be based, like I said before, on CBD percentage, weight of the biomass. There can be a reduction because of spoilage or other reductions. It's very important to have these things um, uh, to have these things laid out in the contract and not uh, not loose. You really want to make sure these are very clear. They are very um, clearly laid out for the parties so that if in fact there's a dispute, you can always go back to the uh, four corners of the document to uh, determine what the in intentions and the expectations of the parties were. Next slide, please. Now let's talk about some additional considerations um, that are particular for all types of contracts, but I especially want to drill down into cannabis and hemp uh, contracts. So. There are some contracts that have exclusivity provisions. For example, you'll find contracts where the grower uh, is exclusive to the buyer, that the grower can only grow and can only sell for that particular buyer. Uh, whether you want to agree to something like that, you know, that's that's a conversation. But um, exclusivity provisions really limit uh, a, a grower to providing for a particular a particular buyer, uh, and I've seen that in contracts, and that's an, a very important consideration to uh, to make when you're entering into one of these contracts. 
As I said before, the clarity of parties is extremely important. Uh, is it the individual farmer that's signing the contract or the company? You want to make sure you've got that nailed down. So liens. So one of the things that's important to consider is if the grower has any liens on their property. So if 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 a buyer is going to buy from a particular grower and there's liens on that property, there could be issues uh, with the grower being able to um, present the uh, the grown biomass to the farmer to the to the buyer if any issues come up. You really want to make sure that you properly vet whoever you're doing business with uh, to determine if there's any outstanding liens, if there's any outstanding claims on any of the property or on any of the, um, the any product that they produce on that particular uh, patch of land. Intellectual property protections. So as a grower and as a buyer, where is the seed and or the clones transplants coming from? Are they protected by intellectual property provisions? Who owns that intellectual property? Who owns the crop before it's harvested? These are all things that need to be taken into consideration and clearly mapped out in the contract. Um, some contracts you'll find have an assignment of the grower's license or in Virginia, the registration. Now, some state statutes say that a registration is non-assignable um, like Virginia. Other states don't say that. So this is something that you want to be, be wary of if you're doing uh, business with uh, somebody out of state and there's a provision in the contract that says the grower's license or whatever license or registration you have is assigned or assignable to the other party. That's something uh, you also want to be wary of. Next slide, please. So some additional considerations. Some contracts have non-disclosure agreements. These agreements say that you cannot discuss sometimes the terms of the deal, the terms of the contract, um, or anything about your relationship uh, with the other party. Uh, that's something you want to be uh, clear about. It's something you want to look at and determine if you want to be bound by that. Um, you want to think about that. Um, inputs. So if, if a grower is growing this particular type of crop, it really needs to be made clear who is responsible for the cost of inputs. Many of the, the times the, these uh, contracts, uh, the farmer uh, bears the cost of the inputs, the fertilizer, the irrigation, the energy, anything that you use to put into the contract. But other times they're not, uh, it, you know, not unlike some um, agricultural production contracts. But these are things that need to be considered. Uh, where are the costs of the in inputs going to lie? Risk of loss is another issue. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about insurance and talked about it in the beginning. Um, but insurance. Now, um, there's general commercial liability insurance. Um, there's also crop insurance. Um, and, as, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, multi peril crop insurance has been made available uh, for 84 counties in Virginia. Um, and multi peril crop insurance is, in fact, available. Uh, this, it's a little late in the growing season now, but it has been made available previously in this growing season. Season, so um, that is something uh, that uh, you should be aware of. Um, delivery. This is something that's often not laid out clearly in these types of contracts. So, who's responsible for delivery of the product to the processor or to the point of sale? Um, is it is it going to be FOB buyer? Is it going to be is it going to be uh, at the processor? You really need to look at who's going to be responsible for transportation costs and who has possession and who's responsible for the product if something happens during transportation. These are all things that need to be clearly laid out in the contract, which is why a cookie cutter contract is not a good idea. THC content, what happens if the crop grown has too high a THC content? Who's going to be responsible for destruction of that? Now, under Virginia, if it needs to be destroyed, the grower is responsible for that. But is there any cost shifting involved in that? That's something you also want to take into account to account as as one of the parties. Clarity of the specifications, the expectations of the party in the contract, testing of, of the crop, sampling of the crop, the protocols, the growing. <clears throat> Who's going to be responsible for testing of the crop to determine, for example, its CBD percentage and content? Whose test is going to prevail? 
Who's going to pay for that test? If you have particular protocols you want during the growing process, for example, if you want organic growth, if you want to make sure it's certified organic, you need to make sure that that's clearly stated in the contract. You need to make sure that um, it, it's it's agreed to and that um, you can you can go back on the contract if, for example, uh, organic growth uh, or something happens with the farmers, for example, organic growth certificate that needs to be uh, clearly laid out. And like I said before, verification, who's going to verify this? Who's going to verify that the protocols were followed? Um, are you going to have something in the contract that allows you to enter the field to verify this? If you are, how many times? These are all things that need to be laid out in the contract. <clears throat> I've seen contracts where none of these things were laid out with any specificity, and then the questions arise and arguments occur, and it's really something you need to have somebody take a look at and determine with specificity. So those are just some of the um, contractual issues that occur in these types of contracts. Um, I could go on for more than an hour about specific contractual provisions, but these are some of the big, big ticket items that you want to be thinking about. Next slide. Let's talk a little bit about banking. First, I'm going to talk about uh, banking for marijuana. We talked about this at the very end of the last provision, uh, the last presentation two weeks ago. Um, the Safe Banking Act in 2019 uh, which prohibited federal banking regulators from penalizing a depository institution for providing banking services to a legitimate marijuana related business did pass the house last year. Um, it is still pending. It was actually put in uh, the latest round of uh, legislation in the house for the COVID-19 relief. It has not made its way through the Senate that provision, but they put the exact same provisions in there. Stay tuned. We'll see what happens. Uh, regardless, even if it comes, even if it comes through uh, banks, even if they are providing services to legal marijuana uh, related businesses, they still have to follow FinCEN guidance, uh, including the um, filing of SARs, which are suspicious activity reports, uh, which we're going to talk a little bit about more. Next slide, please. So let's talk a little about banking for hemp. So not all banks will provide services to hemp related businesses, even though uh, the uh, farming bill of 2018 legalized hemp uh, in the United States, the hemp production, although it's strictly regulated, um, not all banks are willing to get into those that type of industry. Um, additional guidance was provided by the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, the FDIC, FinCEN, and others um, in 2019 to guide banks or lending institutions who intend to uh, provide financial services to hemp-related businesses. Next slide. In a nutshell, those uh, that guidance basically said that uh, financial institutions are not required to file SARS on customers solely because they're engaged in lawful production of hemp. However, um, they are still required under FinCEN if there's any indicia of su suspicious activity. If there's mingling with marijuana businesses, they may be required to file a FinCEN SAR. Um, of course, uh, they're going to require that any, um, any customer comply with state and federal law. Um, whether to provide or offer services to a particular individual or entity is still up to the bank and the bank still must comply with all applicable regulatory requirements, including having Bank Secrecy Act and anti money laundering compliance programs. So that is the guidance. Banks can do it, but they still have to comply with existing law um, that's that's already out there. Next slide, please. So some business considerations, if you're a business and you want to get into the hemp uh, hemp industry um, and you go looking for a financial institution, uh, so one of the things you're going to want to make sure of, and this goes back to something that uh, Anne discussed earlier regarding observing corporate formalities, you want to make sure you have internal co controls, policies, and procedures and demonstrate that you have proper tech checks and balances in your 
entity. Uh, banks are going to ask you for that most likely. Um, you want to make sure you have that. You also want to make sure you have industry knowledge. You need to understand what the legal requirements and risks are uh, in engaging in this type of industry, in this business. Um, as we said in the previous webinar, <clears throat> Virginia submitted its plan to the US Department of Agriculture. They got their feedback. Uh, this the, the current state uh, process will expire October 30th, 2020, and Virginia will have to implement its 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 plan. Um, but it is still regulating under the under its old process that will change, uh, and Virginia is going to have to implement the new federal federal guidelines. Uh, the Virginia plan has not yet been approved by the USDA. Um, but that's in process. So it's really important that if you intend on entering into this business that you understand what those legal requirements are. Uh, you got to have documentation and talked about this a little bit before about piercing the corporate veil. Um, you're going to want to have either audited financials or some t other type of required uh, documentation like business plans and tax returns to prove that what you're doing is legal, that you're properly uh, handling uh, the money and the cash flow that's coming through the business. You also want to make sure you have uh, security and safety training and appropriate plans and protocols for your employees and that you're following general practices and applicable state and federal laws. Next slide, please. So any financial institution that has decided to provide these types of services for entities may be asking you and they should ask for these uh, these types of documentations. So you may have to share your testing procedures or the testing procedures that you follow with the bank, uh, particularly with regard to obviously testing the crop when that becomes required. Right now, Virginia is doing randomized testing. Once their plan is approved and becomes effective no later than October 31st, 2020, they're going to be following the federal rules of testing. Um, so you may have to share those with the bank. They're going to want to make sure that your crops uh, are meeting the def legal definition of industrial hemp. Uh, they're going to want to make sure that you're using proper disposal procedures uh, if in fact the crop is not uh, within legal boundaries. And you're, you know, this goes back to making sure that there's clear documentation uh, as Ann discussed earlier regarding business entities. You got to make sure that the cash flow that's coming through your organization is clear and that you can prove that there's clear ownership and you have no operational ties to marijuana related businesses. Um, if that occurs, uh, and there's an indication that there's uh, a, a commingling with a marijuana related business, business uh, that's going to trigger FinCEN requirements, SARs uh, to be filed by the bank. So you really need to make sure that you're following the law and everything you do and you have appropriate documentation um, for everything you do. Next slide, please. So let's talk about uh, Small Business Association financial assistance to cannabis related businesses, particularly with regard to COVID-19, the Paycheck Protection Program, and all of the recent um, stimulus packages that came out to uh, help businesses uh, with COVID-19. So back in 2018, uh, the SBA basically provided guidance that said, um, no marijuana related businesses are eligible for SBA loans. And they gave these definitions. They gave the definitions of direct marijuana businesses and indirect marijuana businesses. Um, I'm not gonna read to you the definitions because of uh, we're running low on time, but suffice it to say that the guidance came out that said, these types of businesses are not eligible for SBA loans. Um, and these also included businesses that provided ancillary services uh, on a case by case basis. Uh, next slide, please. Also in that guidance in 2018, because at that time uh, hemp was not legal, um, it also excluded hemp related businesses. However, next slide, please. The SBA updated their guidance in February 2019 that indicated that hemp related businesses are eligible for SBA loans, uh, provided that they are a business that grows, produces, processes, distributes, or sells products made from hemp as defined in that statute, they are eligible. However, direct marijuana related businesses and indirect marijuana related businesses are still ineligible because federal law prohibits the distribution of the sale of marijuana. Um, and that would generally involve funds derived from legal activity. However, that being said, there are a number of bills in the House that have been submitted last year and this year that are seeking to 
um, lift that restriction on SBA loans, allowing um, marijuana related businesses to be able to tap into stimulus funds. Those are still pending. They haven't been approved yet. Uh, and one of them was submitted as recently as uh, this, this past month. So that is pending. Uh, stay tuned for that. Next slide, please. So this was a tweet that came out from the SBA back in March of 2020. This very question was asked, uh, are direct marijuana related businesses or indirect marijuana related businesses eligible for SBA loans? And that is a tweet from SBA that basically says, other than uh, businesses that sell hemp and hemp derived products, uh, direct marijuana related businesses and indirect marijuana related businesses are still not eligible for SBA funded services. However, as I said before, stay tuned. That could change depending on the political climate uh, and we'll keep watching that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Ann Bebo to talk about some employment considerations. Thanks, Jonathan. So what about employment? Um, either your business has business, I'm sorry, either your business has employees or certainly your customers or end users of your products um, have employers. So what is the current state of the law in Virginia for um, people who use hemp or cannabis products? So hemp is legal, medical marijuana, if it's dispensed through a licensed pharmaceutical processor would be legal. Um, and simple possession of marijuana has been decriminalized in Virginia, but can someone be fired for testing positive in Virginia? And the answer is generally yes. Virginia law does not provide for any protection in employment for cannabis use or even for CBD use. And that includes CBD that's derived from hemp. So as you know, drug testing typically reveals THC. It does not reveal CBD but even hemp-based CBD can contain trace amounts of THC. And there have been instances where that has um, triggered a positive result in a drug test, in an employment drug test. So that's something that people need to be aware of if they're using CBD products, even if the CBD product is derived from hemp and even if it is labeled as not containing THC because we're finding that sometimes those labels are not completely accurate given that there isn't any standardized testing um, and uh, regulation with regard to product labeling currently. So drug, drug testing will show whether the individual consumed THC within the last several weeks, but of course it doesn't show whether the um, individual is currently impaired. And what we're seeing is there have been some circumstances where an employee using CBD oil will test positive. Um, now, if the person is, or other CBD products. Now, if the person is using CBD oil for a medical condition, as often as the case, or they're taking CBD in some other form for a medical condition, or taking a hemp product in some other form for a medical condition, the employee may be entitled to an accommodation under the Americans with Disabilities Act for the underlying condition. Um, so one question that comes up is, would they also be entitled to an accommodation for just CBD use? And what if it's derived from industrial hemp? And a lot of it, as with many legal issues, will just depend on why the employee is taking either the CBD or other hemp derived product or uh, marijuana derived product and what type of medical documentation the employee has to support that use. You can go to the next slide. So currently the only law that would really apply for Virginia employees would be the Americans with Disabilities Act. And this only applies to businesses that have 15 or more employees. It's the law that generally prohibits employment decisions based on disability, and it requires an employer to make reasonable accommodations to the known disabilities of an individual who's qualified to perform the job's essential functions. Um, by, but the statute itself, the Americans with Disabilities Act, does specify that anyone who's currently engaging in the illegal use of drugs is not a qualified individual with a disability. So if the person is currently using marijuana, then they would not be entitled to an accommodation under the ADA. And one question um, that can come up when someone tests positive for having THC is the it's difficult to establish whether they test it positive because they are using marijuana or sometimes they will claim they test it positive because they are using a hemp derived CBD product. 
And often the employer will be in the position of saying, it doesn't matter, you can't prove where you got this from, and we're going to go ahead and terminate your employment because it's an illegal product that you're using. You're currently engaging the, in the illegal use of drugs. We're going to assume it was marijuana. So that's currently where the law is, and I bring that up only because there are some states that do have um, legal protection for employees that use either um, legal marijuana or that are using um, products derived from hemp. There's actually written into the law an employment protection. Virginia doesn't have any such employment protection, so the employee would only be protected if they fell under the Americans with Dis Disabilities Act. So that is the end of our presentation. You can go to the next slide, please. And at this point, um, we'd be happy to take any questions. I don't see any other pending questions. Someone had asked whether you'll be getting copies of the slides, and yes, we will be providing those. Um, but I don't see any other questions right now. Um, please make sure you go on our website and sign up to receive our newsletters and check in with us periodically. We will be having other presentations from time to time, offering news to um, people in the hemp industry. We hope that you found this informative and um, we look forward to hearing from you at some point. So thank you everybody.